All right. So Robert, uh, a.k.a. Bob Brownick, is currently a professor of mathematics at the University of Southern California. Bob has the unique distinction of growing up in Los Angeles, receiving all his degrees from schools in Los Angeles, uh, BA, MA, PhD from UCLA, postdocing in Los Angeles at Caltech, and obtaining a permanent job in Los Angeles at USC. Uh, as a warning, don't be fooled by this. Uh, you'll most likely run into Bob at conferences overseas or in places like the Institute for Advanced Study, Obervofa, or MSRI. I've had the honor of knowing Bob for over 20 years. During this time, Bob has become one of the most influential leaders in the areas of representations and cohomology of finite groups. Bob was inducted into the inaugural class of the Fellows of the American Math Society and recently delivered a plenary address at the National American Math Society meeting in 2013. Bob will be speaking to us today on applications of the classification of finite groups. Please join me in a round of applause for Professor Robert Brown. Thank you, Dan, for the invitation. Um, Who's there? Uh, it's really a pleasure to, uh, and an honor to be invited to speak here. And uh, I thank the uh, program committee for the invitation. So I want to talk about applications of, finite, of the classification of finite simple groups. It's, uh, so before I do that, let's, let's see. I want to dedicate this talk to Bob Steinberg, who passed away recently on his 92nd birthday on May 25th. Uh, he was on my PhD committee when I was a student, and I took a number of courses from, from him and also kept in touch with him over the years, and he was a huge influence in the subject and <laughs> overall and to me in particular. And so uh, I really want, I want to honor him in this way. I, before he died, in fact, I told him I was invited to give this talk and told him about it and told him that, in fact, that a large part of that invitation was due to his influence, I think. So it was really nice that I was able to do it. OK. So uh, as I said, I want to talk about the classification of finite simple groups. It's, I think, one of the most amazing theorems in mathematics. It's really, in terms of its length, its complication, the enormous number of ideas that go into it, the number of people who worked on it, the length of the proof, of course. But even more so, I think, maybe the number of consequences the, uh, that it has. It, finite group theory comes up in all sorts of things, in all sorts of number theory, algebraic geometry, logic, in almost uh, any kind of thing you can think of. And it's amazing how much we know when we have the classification in hand and how little we know when we don't. Uh, there are so many theorems about finite groups and about finite simple groups that are, you can state using the classification, and which you can't, you can say almost nothing about the classification. So I'll try to give, illustrate some examples of this. So uh, I think, most, I, I, I'll skip over this first slide here quickly. Uh, I think hopefully everybody knows this stuff. So we have a, a, a group, a normal subgroup is closing the conjugation. A simple one is the only non-trivial sub, normal subgroups are the identity and the group. You can look at a normal, normal series and the, the quotients are the composition factors. And it doesn't matter what normal series you take, you have the same set of composition. And so if you want to study finite groups or groups in general, you, you want to certainly one thing to start with is to start understanding the simple groups. Okay. So let me state the theorem. So let you be a finite simple group, then here are the, here's the list of them. There's a cyclic the prime order, there's alternating groups, a group of even permutations, finite groups of type, I'll say a little bit more about those in a minute, and one of 26 more sporadic groups. Um, okay, so that is the theorem. It, I, I'll, the, the proof was uh, completed in 2004. 
with the publication of the book, two-volume book by Michael Ashbacher and Steve Smith. Uh, it was announced in 1983. Slight gap there. But, um, and uh, there's actually a second generation proof going on at the moment, and maybe a third and fourth as well. Uh, and the Ashbacher Smith book actually fits with, finished the original proof, but also is part of the second generation proof. Uh, and when I say that this is an amazing theorem, I, I <coughs> epsilon to do with the proof. Uh, Quinter Ball and I proved a theorem about what are called failure factorization modules, which are used by Ashbacher and Smith. Yeah, and uh, I will say a little bit about the history of this before I go, go on to some of the applications. So, of course, groups of prime order and the alternating groups were known before people even talked about group theory. Uh, me, people talked about symmetric groups going back as early as the beginning of the 1700s, if not earlier. So. Uh, okay, so the, when were the other groups discovered? Well, Fa Matthew, back to you, discovered uh, the first five sporadic groups, called the so-called Matthew groups, in the 1860s and 70s, and in studying certain combinatorial configurations and their automorphism groups. And then, but then there was a little bit of a gap for about a century, and then people started looking at them from, from various points of view, and amazingly, then they were all discovered sort of within a decade, from 66 to 76, 26, and then People kept looking, but didn't find it anymore. And maybe they will never. Maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, there were, so there were 21 more discovered by various people. Yanko, in particular, has a bunch of them. Conway. Um, yeah. Okay. But most of the simple groups. So the, the one, one. Well, let me make a couple of things. So. Uh, People certainly thought, well, once the classification of finite simple groups is done, then that's the end of finite group theory. Well, since I'm a finite group theorist, I certainly don't believe this. But even more importantly, this was asked of Richard Brower, quite a, you know, uh, I think later in his life, when it was a possibility that there would be a classification. And they asked this, and he, his answer was, no, it's just the beginning. And it is just the beginning. We, it's amazing uh, the, the, the number of results that we've had in the last, since the classification, about groups, but about other things as well, is really remarkable. Uh, and I mean, for various reasons. I mean, for one thing, uh, that, that was sort of, in some sense, independent, uh, but came along right at the right time, was the linguistic theory, extending Sandy Green's theory about representations of the groups that we type. And so that's been an amazing tool to study simple groups. OK. So by, the other thing about the classification is that it's not just a list. It really, what it really says is that a finite simple group is pretty typically a finite group of Lie type. And so there's a lot of structure there. Namely, they come, they come from algebraic groups. And so you can use that structure. You can use the, you can use the theory of algebraic groups to study finite groups of Lie type. And because there's too many of them to do one by one. So you have to do them. So you really, this makes a huge difference. So, so a finite uh, group of Lie type is comes from a simple algebraic group uh, over an algebraically closed field of positive characteristic, and you take an endomorphism such that the uh, set of fixed points is finite. And then this is very close to being a finite simple group. Uh, typically, if you mod up, you mod up by the center and then take the derived stuff group, it's almost always finite simple. And standard examples to take SLN. Take the standard for Venus map, the Q power map over the field, and uh, take the, the fixed points are S, just SLNQ. That's not quite simple, but PSLNQ is almost always simple. Okay. Uh, so most of the classical groups, by classical groups, I mean the uh, isometric groups group of form, some sort of form, so linear groups, unitary groups, symplectic orthogonal groups. You know, people had looked at these, of course. Uh, Dixon discovered G2, which is one of the simple three groups, for example. OK. But uh, this was done a little bit more systematically. Chevrolet constructed 
in, basically constructed integral forms of the simple groups, the simple leaf groups. So he said you can actually find, define these things over the integers. And then once you can define them over the integers, well, you can sort of tensor them over any, anything you want. So you get pretty much can get versions of them over any field. And uh, in particular, you can get them over fields of characteristics D, over the finite fields, and in particular this one. Um, so he did this when, when F was just the standard for me. Then Steinberg, in 59, said, OK, well, we can do this from slightly more, some, some more general um, endomorphisms. Namely, for, us, for example, for SLN, you can take the transpose inverse map. So that is an automorphism. So called graph automorphism. It's a graph, it's an underlying it's an automorphism of the pink and diagram underlying the Lee group. And he showed that the construction still works, you still get a group, you still, and it's essentially almost always simple. And uh, so, in particular, you get the triality D4 of 2 this way, you get twisted E6, you get the unitary groups as a construction as well, and some of the orthogonal groups as well. But in particular, you get these two, which you certainly hadn't been seen. Then Re in, in 1961 showed that in fact in characteristics two and three for some of the very small line groups for G2 and characteristic three and B2 and characteristic two and F4 and characteristic two, there was sort of an extra graph isomorphism. Namely, you could interchange long and short roots uh, and, and, and get, end up with an endomorphism of the algebraic group. And you could still take, you had to work a little harder in, in describing what that anamorphism is uh, and the one to, to get the uh, finite set of fixed points. But he did it out, and you get these uh, twisted B2, twisted G2, and twisted B2 and characteristic 2, twisted G2 and characteristic 3, twisted F4 and characteristic 2, and you got three more families. And again, he proved that they're essentially always simple. Uh, the twisted F4 of 2 is not quite simple, but its derived subgroup is, and that was proved by Tietz, actually. It's now called the Tietz group. Okay. Uh, Tietz it, it took a slightly different way of thinking about these things and introduced the notion of BN pairs, which I'm not going to define, certainly. But he classified BN pairs at rank at least three. And they basically all correspond to the groups of Lie types. So this is how you get the building associated with your, with your groups and so forth. Okay, so let's let's go back a little bit in history uh, to to the classification. So that, that's the construction of the groups. So now we have these groups, and well, we can't find any more, so we can't think they're all. Anyway, let's try to prove them. That that's a good way of trying to discover, and in fact, that has been one way of discovering things is trying to prove that it doesn't exist. Except sometimes you prove it doesn't exist even when it does. That's that's a pretty good problem. It's much easier to prove something doesn't exist. All right, so you know, around 1900, uh, Frobenius and Burnside and Schur really uh, proved some very nice results. Frobenius and Schur particularly represented did some what beautiful work in representation theory. Burnside, uh, for example, proved in 1904 that every non-solvable group had had were divisible by at least three distinct primes. Sometimes called Burnside's P to the A Q to the B. And uh, Burnside was, I think, probably the first one to say, hey, you know, I can't find any groups of s simple groups of odd order other than the cyclic ones. Uh, maybe there aren't any. Okay. So he suggested, conjectured there weren't any. And of course, he was right, but uh, he had no clue how to prove it, certainly. So uh, there was certainly work in the, in the early 1900s, but nothing, I, I, you know, besides uh, for being and sure and, and what Burnside did. People really had no clue as to how to think about an abstract subclass of order. There were very few results. But, uh, Richard Brower came on the scene and, and uh, did lots of interesting things, but in particular, he had a sort of way of thinking about simple groups. Uh, basically, one thought he had was let's compute centralizers of evolution. Do we believe they're even order, so there's always going to be an involution. Look at the centralizer. Maybe if we know what the centralizer is, we can figure out what the symbol group is. 
And in fact, there is a theorem that says once you know the centralizer, there are only finite many groups with the, that centralizer. So here was a way of trying to think about it. It turns out, and it, it's useful, but it, it doesn't go all the way. And then, of course, in 63, five times improved that uh, Burnside's conjecture, all groups of odd order are solved. And that was really a tour de force. It was in the Pacific Journal. It was an entire issue, 250 pages long, and everybody thought, my god, a 250-page proof? That's ridiculous. And it was just the start. Um, quite long, quite complicated, using all, some really seminal ideas, and also using character theory in a very serious way. And uh, there's actually a part that could be simplified quite a bit if the number theory, if the number theorists could uh, get get to work and prove uh, this theorem of number theory, which is still open. So. What was really the revolution was at Thompson in 1974 in a series of N group papers. So he classified what are called the N groups, uh, which are every, if you look at the normalizer of every P set group, non trivial P set group, or prime P in your group, if that's solvable, he classified all of the, the simple groups with that property. In particular, the minimum simple groups, the one is in which every proper subgroup is solvable. And well, we, what, it was an amazing theorem. It has actually quite a number of nice consequences as well. But really, this was the model. I mean, this, he introduced some uh, incredible ideas in there that really were the basis of the, of the classification. So that, that really was the turning point. I think without Thompson, there would not be a classification. And of course, this is what he won the field about. Okay. Uh, when this occurred, I think Danny Hornstein and uh, some other people around, particularly Danny, though, thought, aha, okay, I think we can do this. I think we can classify all the finite simple groups. Here, here's their ideas here, and it should work. And Danny basically said, well, it should take about 35 years. And he was pretty close, actually. <laughs> Although, as I said, it was announced in 1983, and as Danny used to say, the reason that it was, you know, so so much it moved so much more quickly than he did is that I, Michael Osbacher came on the scene and started proving one amazing theorem after the other, and, uh, and that's why effectively in 1983, uh, Danny, at that point, it was clear that, that he knew the theorem, the theorem was done. It was sort of like this one part that, well, it wasn't almost, it wasn't quite that apparent. And it just took 20 years or so to actually finish, but, you know, minor detail. And there, however, I think what, what people sort of felt is that uh, there should be a, a second generation group and maybe an end generation group because uh, really nobody can really, especially except for the people who were pretty much dead or retired at this point, uh, can really read it and understand it. And it's scattered throughout the literature. And moreover, when people were proving the, fir the first go-round, they needed theorems to stand on their own. Uh, you're not going to get tenure saying, well, this is part of uh, proving this big theorem that there's no minimal counterexample to. Well, if there's a minimal counterexample, this is useful. So, so people had to work a lot more. So the idea is now, you know the theorem, we're going to just to prove there's no minimal counterexample, and you can use all the properties of the finite simple groups in the proof because you're looking at a minimal counter. And the idea is it would be simpler, and hopefully it'll get finished in my lifetime. Um, so it was started by Bernstein, and, and particularly Lyons, Richard Lyons, and Lyons, all of them are working on it. And there's, as I said, there's a third generation proof. My friend Phil and all are working on some new ideas, and there's actually now this notion of uh, fusion categories, fusion systems that uh, is using some methods in algebraic topology that parts of the classification have proved, been proved using that. But as I said, there's an amazing number of ideas that go into this representation theory, local group theory, which Thompson really, in some sense, developed. 
buildings, Curtis Steinberg gets theory for presentations of the Shemelai groups, which is related to decay, begin with decay theory, amalgamated products, and, and many, many more. As I said, there's only, there's many, many results that can be proved only using the classification. I'm going to try to give a sample of some of them. Uh, and not, not really, I'm not going to go into detail, technical details about this, but uh, certainly in group theory, but also in number theory, and also rate geometry, and so forth. And as I said, more importantly than Celeste, it's a way of thinking about it. That really, you should think about algebraic groups. And any serious finite group theorist really needs to know about algebraic you can't really study finite group theory without them. Okay. So let me give a, a couple of uh, consequences. So the first one is about generating simple groups. So uh, you have a finite simple group. D of G is the number of minimal, the, the size of the minimal generating. Well, I should say it's the minimal size, not the size of the minimal size. The minimal size of a generating set. So every simple group can be generated by two elements. Without the classification, you cannot prove, or nobody has at least, that it can be generated by a million elements, or any particular one. It's a, and Thompson, of course, added one consequence of Thompson's result is that every finite minimal uh, simple group can be generated by two elements. And it, for example, a corollary of that is that a finite group is solvable if and only if every two generated subgroup is solvable. That's the one line consequence of Thompson's there. Here's another one. P2 of G goes to 1 as G goes to infinity. P2 of G is the probability that a random pair of elements of your group uh, generate the group. So the, the point is, in fact, you don't have to work very hard to, to generate with two elements. Pick a random pair, almost certainly you're going to work. This and this is quite useful in algorithmic group theory, because if you want to generate your group, you just say, OK, let's pick a couple. If you know it's simple, you pick a couple of elements. Almost certainly it will work. If it doesn't work, try another pair of probabilities. Again, close to one higher than that. Here's something, uh, another one. Uh, if, if you have any non-trivial element group, there is some other element so that they generate. So this is much stronger than saying you can generate with two elements. This is saying you can pick one, you can fix one, and, and you can find something else to generate. I should say, uh, so the, the first one, as I said, depends on the classification. For alternating groups, this is trivial and was done by uh, Jay Miller around 1900. For, uh, for the groups of we type, it was not, various people did various cases. Albert Thompson did PSLN, but Steinberg did all, really did all, did all the Shelley groups in a 1962 paper in the Canadian Journal. And he conjectured too, but, but he said, well, one can't, the methods that he's using will just not, will not work. But uh, the one thing I say, comparing one and two, is so Steinberg essentially proved one, um, plus the classification. And uh, as I said, Steinberg was quite smart. He could write, pick two elements, but in fact, you don't have to be very smart. You just pick any two elements, and you're, you're in good shape. And the fourth thing is G can be invariably generated by two elements. Well, what does that mean? That means you can pick two conscious classes, and then any element out of one conscious class and any element out of the other, those two generate. And this is very useful in Galois theory, because when you have a a Galois group, uh, one way of, seeing, of trying to see what, what the Galois group is, you, you look at what you reduce mod B, look at the sort of the, what the decomposition group of P, and you see, what, you see what kind of elements you have, but all you see are the constant classes. You can't tell what elements you have. And so what you do is you reduce mod P for enough P's, you see very often that you're getting enough constant classes, for, say it's the symmetric group or whatever your group is, and and you know just from the constant classes, not from the elements that you can actually generate. Uh, two versus one is also a, another example of asymptotic results versus re, what I call real results. I like, I like both kinds, but uh, asymptotic results are typically easier because you can ignore 
the sporadic groups, for example, and, and any finite list of things you want. Uh, but usually it's pretty, it's ineffective. And so you can say, okay, yeah, all, all but finally many things satisfy this, but you don't know any particular thing satisfies. Uh, and so, for example, two says there's only finite many simple groups that can't be generated by two elements. But one says there aren't many. It's much harder to prove. The other, the other nice thing I should say about why I like one is because Oshbacher and I proved the last 12 cases. And so when anybody quotes that theorem, they usually quote Michael. As I said, Thompson did it for the minimal ones, uh, Gene Miller, Steinberg. Really, in some sense, it's really should be called Steinberg. So. For the probabilistic version, uh, Dixon uh, did the, the case of alternating groups, and then Cantor Robotsky did the case of classical groups, and Liebeck and Shelev did the case of uh, the exceptional groups, which in fact now uh, Emmanuel Riard and Terry Tao and Van Green and I have proved a much more general theorem, that which it handles groups of bounded bounded rank, we proved a much stronger theorem, and in particular. We can cross off the back and show them. They're not here. So. And that, nobody here knows them anyways. <laughs> and uh, the invariable generation was done by Richard Moore and myself. And the uh, three was by myself and the Dolphin. Okay, okay, plenty of time. Okay, here, here's one of my favorite applications. Uh, it was perhaps one of, one of the first. Uh, it was certainly done before the classification was sort of officially announced. Uh, it was by uh, Fine, Cantor, and Shocker. And it says, I'll, I'll state the number theoretic version, and then I'll tell you what, that it's in fact equivalent to a theorem in finite groups. Uh, it's not only it follows from it, it's actually equivalent to it. So the number theory should be able to. It says if you have a non trivial algebraic extension field of the rational numbers, and there are infinitely many non-isomorphic finite dimensional central simple direct, central simple division algebras over Q, which split over K. And its detensor K is a full matrix right over K. So there's infinitely many uh, non-isomorphic such division algebras. This, that, the, the Ds that become trivial over K are, are what's called a relative grammar. So that, that is isn't Okay. Yeah, it seems like a basic result about the vision algebra, or the, the number, you know, but in fact, it turns out it's equivalent to the following statement. If you have a finite transitive group of degree n, uh, bigger than one, you can always find an element of prime power order that has no fixed points. It's a simple sounding statement. Give it as an exercise to your undergraduate algebra classes. Maybe somebody can come up with a group. I don't know. Um, if you if you take out the prime power, it's, it was done by Jordan back in the late 1800s, and uh, that you can give as an exercise. How many students will actually get it depends on where you are. Uh, um, but it's a complete trivia. It's it's completely elementary. But this seems. Uh, Nobody has a clue how to prove it without the classification. It's quite easy to reduce the problem to simple groups. And, and another way of saying it is that if you have a maximal subgroup, it boils down to the thing that if you have a maximal, or any subgroup, you can find a simple group, you can find an element of prime power order whose consciousness class doesn't intersect that subgroup. OK. Um, so in fact, I mean that that's a, a common theme in uh, in using the application. It's one, one of certainly the most common ways of using classification is to translate your problem, especially in algebraic geometry or proof theory or so forth, number theory. You can translate it to properties of, your, of a Gal certain Galois group or monotromic group, as it's called sometimes, and uh, and you can translate it into some permutation representation properties of that. Or some, uh, also some maybe a representation theory properties of this. And so you, you can reduce lots of questions to either questions of representation theory or permutation theory. And 
And there's a beautiful theorem in permutation group theory, uh, which probably could have been proved quite a long time ago, but, but because we didn't know much about simple groups, there wasn't much point in it. But it's what I call the ashbach bernan scott theorem, which most people call just the young scott theorem. But it was proved in a paper of ashbach and scott which really says, gives a structure of what are called primitive permutation groups. Those are, are groups where a point stabilizer is maximal or it preserves no equivalence relation, is another way of saying it. And it basically says that you can, if you understand enough about finite simple groups, lots of different things, not just their subgroup, their maximal subgroups, but then you can, you understand primitive permutation groups. And moreover, most problems in permutation group theory, or many, at least many, can be reduced to primitive permutation groups. So if you start with a problem in permutation group theory, you can reduce it often to properties of simple groups. And that's has proved to be a useful tool. For example, the the fine cantor theorem. Uh, the the fine cantor theorem, as I said, it was the first one, but it was really it was a funny way of proving things. I think people had to think about how you should prove things using the classification. So they basically only did a handful of cases and said the rest followed. And, uh, and the referee, because I, I was a friend of all three of them, and I, so I saw the referee report, the referee said, oh yeah, this seems reasonable. Uh, I, I never thought it was reasonable, and I told it, I, didn't, I told Bert Schaffner in particular, this seems completely unreasonable. Um, and actually, if you ask Sarah, you, when he, you ask him about this paper, he says, oh my god, how, is that how group theorists write papers? <laughs> so, fortunately, I generalized the theorem, and there's a complete proof now. All right, here's another uh, theorem. The Zariski, in his thesis, uh, answered a conjecture of Enrique. And, and it's sort of a, like a solubility of radicals. You know. It says if you have a if positive integer, bigger than six, and another one is bigger to the n. You have a generic Riemann surface of genus G, and if you have a map, a rational map, to P1 on that, onto the Riemann sphere, to degree n, then it's not solvable. Meaning the associated Galois group or monotropic group is not a solvable group. So it's the analog of saying if you take a fifth degree polynomial, a generic fifth degree polynomial, the Galois group is not solvable. Um, generic just, has, has, you, you, have, you, know, you can intuitively see what that means, but it, what it really means is there's an open set variety of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Uh, if, if you have an open set variety of that, then you think of that open, the things in that open set as being generic. So what it's telling you is that the things that it do admit a solvable map of degree n uh, form a, a proper set separate the modular space of these two curves. And in fact, it's quite small. That it's not just proper, it's actually pretty small. Now, now his risky's proof was actually proof theory. So uh, he was using the classification, but well, what he was using the classification of primitive solvable groups is really what he used. And so as I said, he reduced the case where F is an decomposable, that is, doesn't factor through anything in between. And that is saying that your associated monitor group is a primitive group, and it's solvable, so it's a primitive solvable group. And those, those were understood in that. Uh, if it's not indecomposable, it turns out it's not so hard. I mean, it, it factors, the only thing it can factor through is another P1, and so you sort of reduce to that case. And, uh, and then he used results about primitive permutation groups. So in fact, the, he used the algebraic geometry to translate, and then you really, but the heart of the proof is with the of course, he also had another influence in the theory is that Gornstein was a student, so. Uh, and introduced Gornstein rings, which Gornstein claimed he never knew what they were. But, uh, if G is six there's, or less, then there's always a degree four map to be one, and so therefore a particular result. So six is short, you can't do it. Okay, well, but using classification, you actually can do better, and uh, this was a memoir that John Trish and I wrote, so if you fix the genus greater than three and an n, if you have a generic Riemann surface of genus G and you have an indecomposable map of degree n, then either G is Sn and the gene and has at least G plus two over two, or G is An and it's bigger than two G. 
So it's it's really saying not only is it not solvable, it's just in fact it's SN. As I said, once you reduce it in the decomposable case, it's either SN or AN. And uh, so it's it's pretty restricted. Uh, for genus three, there's a slightly longer list. Genus two, it, the list is not quite known. The first case was known the whole, certainly uh, in any characteristic, characteristic zero. I can't misspell class of theta. Um, <clears throat> and Fulton proved it, I think, uh, in any characteristic of two. too. And then kind of guard and Brooklyn, and it, it's known in characteristic two as well. And Regard and Brooklyn showed that the, the second case does occur with, with your branch points is corresponding to triple points, for example. Okay. Uh, so as I said, for genus two, there's a short possible list, and pro probably it's doable, although it's a lot of work. Genus one is probably doable with a, a lot of work, but the genus zero case is interesting. Well, generic of genus zero doesn't mean anything. I mean, there's only one Riemann surface of genus zero, the Riemann sphere. So generic just means the Riemann sphere. And, and what's a map from the Riemann sphere to itself is a rational function. So it, suppose you have a non-constant rational function, and you look at the Galois group Cx over Cf of x. That's called a monetary group. Um, and so this was uh, work that John Thompson and I started and was finished by Conrad and Dan Frohart. Says that the composition factors are alternating groups, cyclic groups, and a, a finite list, which is pretty much not a finite list. But in fact, you can actually do more. You can actually say, is it, if you reduce to the default, if you reduce to the uh, decomposable case, one should actually be able to give a list of all the groups that occur. And there's some actually, even in the last month or so, there's some interesting work with Mike Ziv and Danny Nefta, uh, which is leading me to believe that maybe even in my lifetime there will be a complete list of what the, the possible groups are for a rational function, in decomposable rational function. Okay, here's another one, which is uh, about polynomials. Suppose you have a field with characteristic P and you have a polynomial with degree M. And you assume that it's in decomposable, so you can't write it as a composition of two uh, polynomials in a non-trivial way. That's where one of them doesn't have to be one. But it decomposes over some extension field, which it turns out always can, will be taken the algebraic. Then one of the following holds. P is 11, and the degree is 55. P is 7, and the degree is 21. Or the degree is a power of the characteristic. In particular, this can't happen in characteristic 0, which is a classical theorem and does not depend on classification. goes back to it. And then in some joint work I did with Mike Z, you can actually write down the polynomials in the first two cases. It's essentially a unique polynomial that have this property. And the proof requires classification. It, 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 you can translate it to some properties of permutation groups, and it turns out there's essentially two groups that have these properties. But then what's sort of nice is so you get the groups, but then you have to show that uh, this corresponds what the polynomials are, and you do this by translating it to going back to finding a curve with some nice properties, and you essentially proving that curve is unique. So that, that's, that's a really nice, nice part. One thing I like about theorems like this is where you have one or two or a small number of uh, exceptions. Because that, that sort of is an indication that you really need some sort of classification. Because how are you going to see this? I mean, for example, an another example of that, if you classif try to classify six-dimensional uh, linear representations, for example, over the complex numbers, well, you better find J2 or you're not going to have the right list. So, uh, you know. OK. So an another thing about polynomials, if you have a bijective polynomial over a finite field, and there's a more general definition of it, but that's not. And, and, and where the field size is big enough compared to the degree of the polynomial, then you say that this, this is an uh, exception. Uh, and this goes back to Dixon's thesis in the 1890s, and he studied these. And the, the theorem with Mike, it's uh, a couple papers with uh, Mike Zeeb and John Rosenberg, 
uh, it basically says the ones that aren't at degree of power p are known. And, and if, degree, if the characteristic is bigger than 3, they're not very difficult. They're just power, basically a power of x, or what's called a Dixon polynomial, which corresponds to the dihedral root. Um, and that, this seems, I mean, I think it's untouchable with that classification. Here's, here's another one about polynomials, which, again, you might not think, well, how can you prove results about polynomials using classification? Here, it says that if you have a map over a, a polynomial over FQ, then either it's, and, and you let, think of it over Q to the A, then either it's bijective on Q to the A, or, so basically it will be exceptional, or its image misses at least a sixth of the points, it, assuming the degree is prime to the characteristic. It's false for that. And again, that reduces to studying permutation groups, getting a list, checking it. Okay. Here's a group theory example, but it, it comes up, uh, one would want to, cohomology certainly comes up in all sorts of things, and Dan certainly, for example, is one of the experts, like the expert. Uh, if you have a finite group and an absolutely irreducible faithful module over a field, then the dimension of H1 is at most a half the dimension of the module. That's usually not close to correct, but there are examples. The worst case, there's a four-dimensional module or a two-dimensional H1. And the dimension of H2 is at most 20 times the dimension. Uh, that's probably, probably 20 is, should be a half, but uh, the, the H1 should, I mean, it should be much, much better, but I made a conjecture back in the 80s, which is completely wrong. Uh, but, and so up to about uh, two years ago, the largest known H1 under those hypotheses was three-dimensional. Uh, at a conference in AIM, there was, and a couple of weeks after of computing, there's now a 10 million dimensional each one. So. All right. Um, but again, I think without the classification, it would be hard to get any sort of a And a corollary of this, which is in some sense uh, for the H2 result where this came from, if you have a finite simple group, it has a pro-finite presentation that is uh, Right, it is a quotient of the free profile group modulo, a closed subgroup. And the, the generators for that as a closed normal subgroup is the relations. With two generators and at most 20 relations, uh, the right answer should be four. But, uh, and even if you, if you assume it's a real presentation, that is a you know, free group modulo with some finite general subgroup, then uh, that still should be four. But that's, that seems kind of rich at the moment. As I said, but you can, you can get, replace the 20 by 50 at least with, with a, real, a real presentation, except for one family, Twisted G2. This is one of the groups uh, reconstructed. I'm sure it's true, but just nobody knows how to do it. Here's another one about, about subgroups of GLNC, which you think of as <coughs> And it turns out for the weak, the weak, the case of positive dimensional or connected groups, it is true, quite easy to do. But it, so this was a question that uh, Kohler, Janusz Kohler and Michael Larson asked. Suppose you have the reducible on a symmetric power of the, na of the natural module uh, for d bigger than 4. Then the conjecture is that it either contains a symplectic group, which does that for reducible, or the special linear group. <coughs> Uh, it turns out that's true except in dimension 6 and 12 because of a pair of sporadic groups that have representations with this property. Although if you go up to 7, <coughs> the 7 symmetric power is fine. And this came from a problem about vector bundles. Uh, let's see, I think I've got, let me skip Peter Neumann's. Uh, I'll skip this one. And I'll end with one, again, because I was talking about Steinberg. Here, here's one of my favorite ones. Uh, there's a very nice, beautiful, easy result that when I learned as a graduate student was that if you have a finite solvable group and you take a maximum subgroup that has prime power index. It's quite easy to prove. But. And so I, I saw this and I ran up to Bob Steinberg and I said, oh, is this, is this how you can uh, classify solvable groups this way? It's just saying that if you have all your maximum subgroups have prime power index. I thought about it for about two seconds and said no. Um, 
Oh, this is not the right one. That's a nice temperature thing. He said, there's SL3 too. And so I said, oh, OK. And a few years later, I came back to it. And it turns out, yes, that's the one counterexample. So if you have a finite group, and every maximal separate best prime power index, then it's essentially solvable, or it has a solvable normal subgroup and a quotient is PSL32. Um, so, uh, I Sandberg's a lot smarter than I, I am, but uh, on the other hand, I had a little more perseverance. I mean, as a graduate student, I didn't, but finally I came back to it. And so, uh, let me stop here. It turns, it turns out sort of the less, the, the more complicated the group is in terms of the simple, you know, the more non abelian simple groups that occur, the easier it is to say something about the group. But the sort of the, the less, you know, the more solvable it gets, the worse it gets in some sense. So B groups are, are a mess, or a mess. So, it, you know, that, it's, an it's a very interesting problem. And for example, there's lots of theorems about say, counting how many there are of them. There's a lot of them, and things like that. And there's ways of trying to organize them so that you can say something about them. But certainly, classifying them is, is hopeless. Other questions? OK, so if not, on behalf of the organizing committee, we'd like to present Bob with a gift. Thank you. And let's make Bob with a gift.